what's the story with oxalates? These compounds that are typically found in many foods that when at high levels in the blood or urine have been related to kidney disease, but specifically development of calcium oxalate kidney stones, which are both painful and a threat to your kidney health, as well as a cause for urinary tract infections. So people have been told to follow a diet that is low in oxalates, meaning a diet low in such foods as spinach, kale, lentils, legumes, chard, beets, almonds, peanuts, <laughs> avocados, uh, meaning you have to follow a very restrictive diet in order to follow a low oxalate diet. So the average American gets somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 milligrams or so of oxalates per day just by eating these otherwise healthy foods. And if you reduce your oxalate intake to 50 uh, milligrams or less, it tends to reduce the likelihood of these conditions, health, uh, health conditions in the kidneys and kidney stones. Now, add oxalates the growing list of food intolerances modern people have. It could be FODMAPs, fibers and sugars. It could be nightshades, like eggplant and tomatoes, that cause all sorts of symptoms. It could be a histamine intolerance to foods like cheese and wine that causes skin rash, asthma, and other reactions. It could be legumes or fructose-containing foods like, like fruit. Or it could be people who have a high uric acid and thereby gout in their joints. It could be high homocysteine. In other words, there's a growing list of intolerances that are modern phenomena. Your great-grandmother had virtually none of these food intolerances. Almost nobody had these food intolerances. Yet modern people, an increasing proportion of modern people, have these multiple food intolerances. So much so, you'll hear people say things like, I eat from a list of only seven foods. Everything else makes me sick. Think how unnatural that is if you are trying to survive in a wild environment by hunting and gathering. You, you, you can't kill something or find a food and say, I can't eat it because I'm intolerant. You wouldn't survive very long. So these are very counter to human survival. And they all emerged over the decades since the invention of penicillin and other antibiotics. We know, for instance, that if you took a course of antibiotics recently, it increases the likelihood that you have both food intolerance, intolerances and higher oxalate levels in the blood and in the urine. So the solution is not to avoid the food. While you can do that, if you have any of those food intolerances, it's, it's okay to reduce your exposure to those foods, like let's say FODMAPs or histamine-containing foods or oxalate-containing foods, temporarily, but that is not a long-term solution. The solution is to address the lack of microbes that allowed this process to emerge in the first place. Now, wonderfully, the list of microbes that we know process oxalates is long and is growing all the time. It includes species like Lactobacillus plantarum, Lactobacillus acidophilus, Oxalobacter formigenes, Lactobacillus paragasseri, Lactobacillus paracaceae, Bacillus subtilis, Saccharomyces boulardii. In other words, there's a long list of microbial species that are meant to be in your gastrointestinal tract that process oxalate for you. Now, the wonderful thing is that these microbes tend to reduce oxalate levels in the gastrointestinal tract and in the urine via different mechanisms. The great thing about that is if you were to combine two, three, or more of these microbes, that reduce oxalate levels by different mechanisms, you tend to get synergistic effects. So preliminary evidence suggests that restoring a healthy gastrointestinal microbiome has spectacular effects on reducing intestinal blood and urinary levels of oxalate. Now what's not yet clear, but we're getting close, is just what group of microbes is ideal. So right now we're left with all the things we do in general to rebuild a healthy microbiome. Recall that modern people have decimated, have destroyed their gastrointestinal microbiome. It could be in the form of colonic dysbiosis that leads to such things as ulcerative colitis and diverticular disease. It could be SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where that colonic dysbiosis has allowed the overproliferation and then the ascendance of fecal microbes into the 24 feet of small intestine but you, you have a small intestine filled with fecal microbes. In other words, in these situations, colonic dysbiosis, 
small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you have the proliferation of unhealthy microbes, inflammation, and loss of the species that process oxalate, as well as uric acid and all the other things that people think they're intolerant to, all the other food factors people think they're intolerant to. The solution is therefore not just avoidance of the food. That's a near-term way to reduce symptoms. The real solution is to rebuild your gastrointestinal microbiome. How do we do that? Well, recall that I liken your gastrointestinal microbiome to a backyard vegetable garden. So let's pretend it's May and it's nice and sunny and warm. You're going to start your vegetable garden. How do you do that? Well, you start out by laying out a plot, right? Maybe a 10 by 10 plot. You clear the soil of weeds, stones, twigs, and other debris. You plant seeds. And then you water and fertilize it throughout the growing season. At the end of the season, you've got green peppers and squash and cucumbers or whatever. Your gastrointestinal microbiome is very much the same. We're going to clear the soil, meaning you do such things as avoiding herbicide and pesticide residues in food. So you buy organic food whenever possible. Never GMOs, of course, because they're laced with glyphosate. You minimize your exposure to antibiotics, which ordinarily would decimate your gastrointestinal microbiome. So take them only if you absolutely must, of course. Get rid of drugs like stomach acid blocking drugs, especially like drugs like uh, Prilosec and Asifex, these so-called PPIs or proton pump inhibitors, as well as the H2 blockers. You want to get off and uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because they increase intestinal permeability. You want to avoid processed foods and uh, choose whole foods. So processed foods have such things as preservatives that are antimicrobial in food, but also in you. You avoid food with uh, long lists of additives, especially emulsifying or mixing agents like polysorbate 80 or carboxymethylcellulose. So you clean up your life. You prepare the soil. Then you seed your gastrointestinal tract. Now those seeds take several forms. One form would be fermented foods, kefirs, fermented vegetables, sauerkraut, fermented pickles. And these you can buy commercially or you can make them yourself. Very easy to do. If you don't know how to do that, see my super gut book. See the many other resources online that show you how to ferment vegetables. It's very inexpensive. It's very easy to do. Also, make my yogurts, but specifically a SIBO, what I call SIBO yogurt, a combination of lactobacillus roteri, lactobacillus gasseri, and the most recent recipe is, includes bacillus subtilis. These are species that are known to either colonize, or in the case of subtilis, germinate in the small intestine, because that's where SIBO occurs, right? And they'll also, of course, colonize the colon. And that's where they produce, both in the colon and small intestine, they produce bacteria since natural antibiotics effective in killing those excessively proliferated fecal microbes and allowing the return of beneficial microbes including many of the species that consume oxalate so that's the seed and then you water and fertilize your garden which means just feed your microbes with fibers and related compounds root vegetables legumes jicama asparagus, Brussels sprouts, onions, garlic, shallots, all the things we talk about that nourish microbes. And you rebuild over time, you restore those microbes that consume oxalate for you. So we eradicate colonic dysbiosis and SIBO. We allow the restoration of beneficial species, including many of the species, many of them, five, seven, ten, that consume oxalate, and you should see a dramatic reduction in oxalate, and you don't have to follow a restrictive low oxalate diet, or for that matter, low FODMAPs, low histamine. All that stuff almost always goes away with restoration of the microbes that consume all those adverse things. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about or want to know more, of course, see my super gut book, see my other YouTube videos on these topics, see my Defiant Health podcast, or if you need some hand-holding, some guidance, some help, I have a membership website where we discuss these things typically once a week for a couple of hours. And that's in my innercircle.drdavisinfinitehealth.com website. So lots of resources I put out there because sadly a lot of this information not being passed on to you through your doctor. If you Google Oxalate, you'll see all kinds of misinformation, bad advice, 
low oxalate diets, and all kinds of other things. And those things are just not necessary. So much of this has to do with the massive disruptions we've introduced into our gastrointestinal microbiomes due to all those factors we talked about.